So this is Chemistry 109. It's the online version. And I'm Dr. Sensky, and I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to hopefully record these lectures. I can't see if it's recording, but we'll see. Anyway. All right, so basic chemistry. You need some serious basic chemistry to understand all the chapters that come after this. Best way to do this is to actually take notes as if you're in the classroom, because you're all in the classroom, you should put your phone away. I don't see why you need to have your phone out while you're watching a lecture. Maybe I'll do two 50 minute lectures. So that'll make up for the fact that it's a two hour class once a week. All right, so you have atoms. I'm using a document camera that I've turned upside down. I think it'll make it uh, make the screen be clear because it won't autofocus as I walk around. And well, that's even worse. I'm gonna try to find a good pen here. All right. You have atoms and their matter. In my opinion, matter is um, like anything that's a noun. Although you could probably say there are some things that are nouns that are not matter. Sure, you can. Like I can have an idea. One of these pens is going to be good. Been sitting here all summer. Anyway, and it's made up of sub atomic particles. Let's see, when did I start this? That clock says five minutes of five right now, so I should lecture until quarter of six. Made up of subatomic particles. You have protons, pure O-T-O-N-S, and they're positive, and you have neutrons, and the neutrons are neutral, and you have electrons. And the electrons are negative. Now, your protons and your neutrons are in your nucleus. This isn't going to be a math based class. I think you know that. If you read the syllabi, your protons and your neutrons are in the nucleus, and then you have shells. And the shells have electrons in them. So in terms of weight, one proton weighs as much as one neutron. Pretty much, one proton weighs as much as one neutron. I'm saying from this line to this line, and I think that's going to keep this in focus for you weighs as much as 1,836 electrons. You do not need to know 1,836, but 1,836 versus one, I'm trying to show that electrons are extremely light. In terms of charge, one proton completely is equal but opposite to one electron. So even though an electron is extremely light compared to a proton, an electron uh, can cancel out a proton for charge. So you have atoms. Let's particularly think of one, like let's think of iron. There's an atomic symbol for iron. When you look at this, there should be online this periodic table. You should print this periodic table out and I'll reference it. So you'll have this printed out next to you as you sit there at a desk with bright light, looking at a screen, taking notes. Okay, that's what I would really like. Um, but either way, this periodic table, we're gonna talk a lot about it. It has some numbers on it. It has big numbers, larger numbers, and smaller numbers next to each atom. I could bring it up close, but then the thing will auto focus. Let's see what it does. All right. So if you see on this periodic table, there are some numbers 
and the numbers are like 10.3489, where the number below it is a whole number, just like five or something. All right, let's see. Did you autofocus back here? I think you did. Let's press the autofocus button anyway. Let's see if we can make it do something. Eh, it might work. So let's look at iron. On the periodic table, it says iron is 55.847 for the larger number and 26 for the smaller number. The symbol Fe, because it's a different language, ferrous or ferric is where it's going to come from. But either way, this says 55.847. Let's say it says 56. There's a reason I'm doing that. Let's say the atomic number, not let's say, the atomic number is 26. Now, the smaller number is the atomic number. And this is the number of protons or electrons in a neutral atom. The atomic number is the number of protons or electrons in a neutral atom. It says they are being recorded. So I'm hoping this is recording. I'm not just speaking and it doesn't get recorded. But if you're watching it, it must have been recorded. Then there's the atomic weight. And that is the number of protons plus, it's different, the number of neutrons in the atom. Eraser. Good. So for iron, this form of iron has an atomic number of 56. And I'll reason it's called this form of iron. And Atomic weight of 26, I mean to say, an atomic number of 26. So it has 26 protons, and they're in the center of the atom. They're in the nucleus. And it has 26 electrons, and the number of electrons are going to change. They're going to go up or they're going to go down, or they're going to stay the same. But it has 26 electrons, and they're in the shells, and they have very little weight. Then, the atomic weight is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So 56 minus the 26 protons equals, I hope, 30 neutrons. This form of iron has 30 neutrons. So, make a long story short, you've got 30 neutrons, 26 protons, and then you have electrons somewhere out here, and there'll be a total of 26 of them, and I'll explain what some of out here will be. This will be the first shell, the second shell, and a shell is an energy level or distance from the nucleus. Remember, electrons are extremely light. So most of the space around us is empty. Like my hand should go through this wall. Because the only real solid part would be the center, the 30 protons and 30 neutrons. The reason my hand won't go through the wall is it's made of atoms as well. And it's got shells of electrons as well. So you have negative electrons from the wall and negative electrons from my hand. And I would actually break my hand if I hit it too hard into the wall. But it doesn't mean it's not almost all empty space. Most of what we have is empty space. Now that we have that up, I need to describe another particle to you. There's a reason for it. You have protons, which are positive and have a weight. 
and neutrons, which are positive and have a weight. And then in the shell, I'm sorry, neutrons are neutral. And then in the shell, you have electrons that are negative and have very, very little weight, but they have a weight. Then there are massless particles of energy. It's hard to describe a massless particle of energy, but I will. They're called photons. I'm being hit by photons from these fluorescent lights right now. I don't have the fluorescent lights in the back of the room on because then there'd be a reflection here that might be annoying to you. They're hard to talk about because they don't have a weight. So we talk about a parameter of them or about a few parameters, some ways to describe them. First, they all travel at the speed of light in the same stuff. They all travel at the same speed in the same stuff. They can have different energies, but will travel at the same speed in the same stuff. So you could have a high energy photon and a low energy photon, and they'll get from point A to point B at the same amount of time. Now, when I keep saying the same stuff, our air is pretty, really, not very dense stuff. I can walk around in our air and I don't feel like I'm impeded by the air, like the air is stopping me from moving, unless it's really thick, I guess, uh, with a lot of humidity, which is water vapor. But the speed of light in the air is pretty close to the speed of light in the universe, which is a vacuum mostly. If you take light and shine it into a bucket of water, it's going to seem to like bend a little bit. So the speed of light would be different in a different stuff, set of stuff or a different medium, we'll say. OK, but you need to know they all travel at the same speed, but they have different energies. How do they have different energies? Well, it's going to be a bit hard to draw. But let's say this is point A and this is point B. The photon, this massless particle of energy, is traveling straight. It's not going up and down. It's going to look like it's going up and down, but it's not going up and down. It's traveling straight. And let's say this is photon one, and below it I'll have photon two. I mentioned a moment ago that uh, the photons can be talked about by the parameters of uh, how they behave. Well, I said they all travel the same speed, OK? But they have different energies. How would we know they're different energies? They emit something as they travel. They emit a wave. They emit an electric wave, and they emit a magnetic wave. OK, it's going to become important, those two words. So as this photon is traveling straight at the speed of light, it's emitting this wave. And I'm going to draw that again a different way. Photon two is higher in energy, so it's emitting its wave this much. When you think of the wavelength, it's the distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave, from crest to crest of the wave. So in this case, this is the wavelength, and that's a small Greek lambda. You're wondering. And then from here to here, this is the wavelength. So, this second 
second photon, photon two, seems to be much more hyper and higher in energy, but it's got a smaller wavelength. So we can say the higher the wavelengths, the smaller or lower the energy. Photon one and photon two both get from point A to point B, at the same, from point A to point B at the same amount of time, but photon one has a bigger wavelength, so it's a lower energy. Alloys here. So to be really completely correct, here's a photon traveling. It's emitting a wave, a vector. This photon, let's say, is emitting an electric vector. 90 degrees to it, it's emitting at the same amount of times or at the same frequency, a magnetic vector. And this is nicer to draw, just one of the two parameters, but I'll draw this one here. That, like that, like that. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and this probably should have went a little bit further to come out like that. But that's a bit hard to draw. But this would be the electric vector, and this would be the magnetic. And together, we say a stream of photons is called electro, T-R-O, magnetic radiation, or you could say energy, and it's probably more correct to say energy. If you have an atom that gives off a stream of photons on its own, that would be radiating from that atom, so that would be radiation, but this is electromagnetic, so they have uh, EMF electromagnetic frequency, if you hear about all like in all those movies and things like that. OK, so what can we do with these photons? Well, I want to describe just some of the things that are photons. Luckily, this is recorded, so I can erase it and you can play it back or you could freeze it and write notes. But I'm telling you, you learn more by writing notes because as you're writing a J or you're writing a G, you're memorizing something. If you're just typing something, it's the same exact thing your hand's doing for a J or a G. So there's better memory um, if you actually rewrite notes as a professor is speaking. I could do this whole class with PowerPoints. I could point at things and say, look at that, look at that, like a lot of people like to do. But I think you can only write as quickly as I could write, so this seems to keep the class at a decent speed. You go over the students sometimes, and plus they fall asleep and they play with their phones. Hopefully you guys won't. This is gripping to you. All right, so now I want to talk more about these photons. Types of photons that you know. All right, so I'm going to write inside here. It's going to be a lot of stuff. I wish I could just find the pen I love. They're all slightly started, but none of them is just great. So let's make this high energy. High E, so that's small wavelength. And we'll make this low energy. Low E, so that's big wavelength. There's an inverse proportionality. It is not a direct proportionality. It don't go up the same or go down the same. One goes up and the other one goes down. The highest energy photon is gamma. Now, symbol for gamma looks like that. If you uh, see movies when they talk about gamma radiation, it's extremely dangerous. It's extremely high energy. You're not going to turn into something uh, with a lot of power. You'll just get sick and get radiation 
and probably getting some kind of a cancer from it. Or just radiation sickness, it'll kill your cells. Cascading effect. High energy gamma radiation. Below that, emitting its photon, and this is not drawn to scale, I have no idea. This scale would have to be in like um, many meters, okay, because it's like a wavelength of the distance from crest to crest. Okay, so anyway, these are X-rays. Let's make an X here. Say the word rays. X-rays are dangerous. If you go to, uh, let's say, the dentist, and they're doing the concept of greater good, they're basically saying we would need to see inside this person's head to see if there's a cavity because cavities can cause infection. They can hurt somebody really badly. We will irradiate their skull. Now, we're going to put a lead thing over their chest because we know radiation isn't good, so we're going to protect their vital organs, but they're irradiating your skull. You would think your brain would be a vital organ, but they're saying, yeah, but we have to uh, do this because it's more important to find out if they have a cavity. And then what does a dental hygienist do? They leave the room <laughs> because they shouldn't get that much radiation. Um, so it's, it's greater good. It's, it's something that's dangerous, but you do need it sometimes to get an x-ray. There are different types of scan, CAT scans, uh, uh, probably uh, MRIs, all kinds of things, magnetic resonance imaging, it's a long story. Anyway, so x-rays are still quite dangerous. Then below that, you have ultraviolet energy, UV radiation, UV energy. The UV energy is pretty high from the sun, and you can get cancer from that. Luckily, your Earth, you personally own the Earth, has an ozone layer, O3. We'll talk about that. And what happens is O3 will absorb the UV energy, do something with it. It makes them O2 plus O, but in the process, you don't get hit by it. There was a whole thing in the 1970s we talked a lot about um, with a hole in the ozone layer. There seems to be a cyclical thing that happens because of the fact that there's um, the North Pole and the South Pole, and the South Pole gets a pretty big hole in the ozone because it's six months of darkness, six months of light, that kind of stuff. And we measured it at different times of the year. We got confused in the 1950s and 60s, and we thought, oh my God, it's totally disappearing very quickly. It really wasn't totally disappearing very quickly. We just had data from different parts of the year. We didn't understand it. But if you live in Australia, sometimes the hole can almost get as far as Australia, and it gets a pretty thin ozone layer over you. So hanging out outside in the sun in Australia would be worse than hanging out inside um, on, up in a got to New Jersey or something like that. So anyway, there goes your um, ultraviolet. And now there's a really small, small, small sliver of visible radiation. You only have receptors, luckily, for a very small sliver of photons. I think if you had receptors for every other type of photon, you'd be bombarded with all these photons and you wouldn't know what to do with all of the, I mean, you are bombarded with them, but you don't see them. You don't know you're being bombarded. So let's see, red, green, Roy G. Biv, right? So this breaks up to Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, right? And then violet. Make a long story short, violet is the highest energy of the photons you can see. And red is the lowest energy of the photons you can see. Ultraviolet means above violet. You have receptors for this. Now, below this, there's the infra red. Infrared is lower energy photons. All of these are photons. They're massless particles of energy. But you don't get hurt badly from infrared, and you do get hurt badly from x-rays or gamma 
four of UV, but still X-rays are gamma very much, right? So anyway, getting past that infrared light, there's some animals that can see it, okay? The animals that can see it like are cats. So if you're sitting at a campfire or you're sitting at an outdoor bonfire and you look at the wood, and it seems to be glowing incredibly brightly, but it's dark out there. That's because you don't have receptors for it, but there's a ton of infrared energy. I often think cats must look at like glowing embers and just be totally thinking that's the brightest darn thing in the world. Okay, they can't see in the dark. They say they see in the dark, but they see with any infrared light. So they, they can see around the house at night. They wonder why you're stepping on them probably. They can't see uh, colors. They see black and white. All right. so. We're getting to a point where these photons, and by the way, the infrared photon is traveling at the same speed as the gamma photon, but it's less energy because it emits its vector less often, less frequently. Okay, there's something called frequency that is proportional. Getting below infrared, I guess we'll go here to microwaves. I'm trying to teach you the language of chemistry so I can talk about certain topics. If you looked in the syllabi and you're absolutely curious about what we're doing. We're doing things like drugs and fitness and stuff like that. And so a little bit of biochemistry is needed for it. A little bit of all types of chemistry is needed for it. It's the end of the book, but you don't just start with the end of the book. So I'm just doing like stuff in the first 16 chapters, but definitely not all of the first 16 chapters, just enough to give you the language of it. I'm skipping all the math. So anyway, microwaves, you know these because we use them to shake up bonds in water. This is water. Now we'll explain why it looks like this really soon. It's gonna be called covalent bonding. But because it looks like that, and it has those lone pairs of electrons, what can happen is electrons can absorb photons of energy and do something with the energy. They can move faster then they can give the energy back because the energy is not created or destroyed. It's kind of the law of the thermodynamics. So because your food has a lot of water, you can shake it up with some photons. Okay, now I want to explain something about photons. I know I'm not doing math, but I do need to show you an equation, a mathematical equation. I don't have a choice, I think, at this point. Here we go. E equals H C over wavelength. There's a reason I'm showing you that. E equals H C over wavelength. It's used for photons. There's no place for mass or weight in this. It has energy and it has wavelength. They're inversely proportional. As this goes up, since it's a denominator, that must go down. Now, these two things are constant. This is the speed of light. And this is Planck's constant. He's a big important person uh, from the 20th century, figured out that uh, energy is quantized for these photons. It becomes pretty important, but not for this class right now. But there's a number that falls out of these equations. And when you make an equation and a number keeps falling out when you put an experimental data in, at some point you just write, you know, we can make energy equal speed of light over wavelengths as long as we multiply it by this thing. Okay? At some point you just put that thing there and you say that's it. It's a fudge factor. Okay? But it becomes a constant you can't get rid of. Now, this rock here, C over wavelength, is something we call nu, which is a weird looking V. This is called nu, the symbol is, and it's called frequency. Try not to make that squeak too much. This is called nu, so that is some sort of a frequency. You can substitute this nu in for C over V here. And what do you get? You get E equals h nu and they are directly proportional now the frequency how frequently the photons um electric vector goes above the crest 
is directly proportional to the energy. That photon that was going up and down a whole lot, he's got a very frequent uh, crest, and he's also got high energy. So now they are directly proportional. Here they were inversely because he was in the denominator. Getting past that, it's hard to discuss a photon because it doesn't have any mass. So we actually write the symbol for a photon as a, as a chemical equation, all right? So instead of saying just energy, which could be energy, energy, heat, energy, this is energy of a photon, H nu. Where do you see this? If you had one of those little books you have as a younger student, hopefully, and they show the sun, and they talk about, well, here's the sun, and they talk about the sun giving light to the plants and the plant giving food to the cow, and they show this whole, you know, circle of life kind of thing. It's a cartoon. It looks like a, like a religious publication or something like that. But looking past that, when they want to show the sun giving energy to this little tree, this badly drawn tree, they show like a Zeus hand of God lightning bolt, and then they write H new over it. And you probably always wondered, why is there a lightning bolt in so many of my biology texts, H nu? Because we just have no other way of writing what a photon looks like. Since it's a massless particle, we can't draw a picture of it. So we actually show a piece of math. And that's the only reason why I needed to show you this mathematical equation becoming this mathematical equation, because this is how we see photons. Anyway, so microwaves, you're not terrified of your microwave. You shouldn't you know, put things in the microwave that don't like to be shaken up. Water, it's a loose agglomeration of all these water molecules together. But if I take like a fork, and a fork is nothing but metal atoms in a rigid structure, they do not like being shook up and they spark. So there are some things you don't put in a microwave, which I know you know. But you're not terrified. Could we use x-rays to heat up your food? Of course we could, but we would get cancer, okay? So let's just use something that's pretty safe. It's lower energy than visible light. I hope that makes sense. Okay, what's down here? There has to be something down here. This is um, all the radio waves. So this is like FM frequency modulation, or AM, or there you go all your cell phone signals. Your cell phone signals are just a stream of photons that luckily you don't have receptors to see. My cell phone could ring. Well, in this room it wouldn't really ring because Pasture 180 is the tornado safe room and it's really hard and I know that your phone might ring if it's an Apple and it has like Wi-Fi to ring or something like that, but it's definitely got some low reception. I'll put it that way. But my cell phone could ring. I could get a short wave radio right now outside, turn it on and I can pick up Radio Moscow. I can pick up Cuba. So photons from Moscow and Cuba are floating around everyone on the planet at all points and all times. Luckily, we can't see it. But also photons, like if my phone rings, that means my phone signal will happen to be traveling by me. All phone signals are traveling by everyone all the time. In the 1970s, when we started to have two, because I'm really old, I'm 56 years old, if you're curious. Um, in the 1970s, when we used to have uh, just FM stations and AM stations, we had like three TV stations, right? Once we started getting more, people started to freak out and they said, there's just too many photons floating around. They started to wear aluminum hats and people used to say, oh, he's going to get an aluminum hat and talk to himself now. He's going crazy. Today, everybody walks around talking on their cell phones to themselves and you can't tell who's kind of you know, has some issues like that. But back then, people were afraid of those photons. Like when I was a kid, you could turn on AM radio in New Jersey. Yes, I'm from New Jersey. And you would get Ohio, <laughs> all right? There was just so few signals. It was like, what, only three trillion, three billion people on this planet. Now there is probably almost eight billion people on this planet. We're breeding so fast. Every four and a half days, there are one million more people net. If I took a photograph of every human that's alive on this planet right now, and then four and a half days I took another picture, it's in your book, believe it or not. I get everything from your book. Another, I learned everything from your liberal arts chemistry book. But in another four and a half days, there's one million more humans. 
we're not going to solve any of our problems because they're breeding so fast. Okay, we all need stuff. Let's leave that alone. Luckily, we can go to another planet soon. Hopefully, we can go to Mars. But there's a problem with Mars. If you're curious, I can't float right now because of the gravity that's holding me down. You probably realize that I haven't floated. Now, when our solar system was formed, there was the Earth, and not too far from it, there was Mars. They're not that close, right? Mars is a little bit smaller than the Earth. Your air is about 80% nitrogen gas and 20% oxygen gas. Okay, that's exciting. If I take a helium balloon, helium is lighter than air. So if you put a balloon and fill it with helium, it floats. Helium is a byproduct of the natural gas industry. It's under the earth. It doesn't burn. Hydrogen floats as well, but it burns. They get the Hindenburg, look that up sometime. So anyway, helium. If you open a balloon, the helium goes away and leaves the planet. The gravity can't hold the helium. At some point, we will run out of all helium, and then we'll have nothing left except for flaming balloons with hydrogen in them, OK? It's kind of a sad story. There'll be no more people squeaking with their voices as they talk with helium. But for now, we have a helium supply. But what I'm trying to register with you right now, and that's probably not in context, is the gravity of the Earth is not strong enough to hold the helium, but it can hold the Ni N2 and it can hold the O2. It can hold that little tiny bit of CO2 even. But Mars is too small. So when it was forming and it was cooling down, there was enough gases coming from the formation process. We both had decent atmospheres. They had water, we had water. They had rivers, we had rivers. And I'm not saying there's anybody there but sand, okay? But it would have been fine. But once it cooled down, there was no more gases coming from the Earth to feed it. Sadly, all the oxygen floated away. And now all you have is H2O frozen underneath there, which is kind of nice. We can someday go to Mars, and we could live on Mars and get back off of Mars because we could take the frozen oceans and make O2 to breathe, because it's not in the air. There's not much, and it's very thin air. It's got mostly CO2 in it. If you notice, when they parachute in there, it definitely looks like it's floating in some kind of gas, all right, some kind of air. So we can make O2 to breathe, and H2 we can use for rocket fuel to get off of this thing, okay, to get back to the Earth. That would be fun. The equator gets to about 32 degrees Fahrenheit sometimes. It gets really cold and really hot. There's no water to moderate that. We'll learn about the water cycle. But the equator gets to a decent temperature. You could actually wear short sleeves on Mars a certain time of the year. But the only reason I brought this up is because there's no ozone layer and the ultraviolet would give you horrible cancer. So someday when we go to Mars, we're going to have to have a lot of sunscreen. All right, so anyway, that takes care of that. I'll tell you what I want from that, but I definitely want you to know um, what photons are. And I would like you to understand that these are all the exact same particles. It's kind of nice if you understand that FM, AM, radio, and all those things are all the same. Continuing on. Hmm. Going to erase this now. Back to my atom. I've discussed four different particles. You can go lower. Muons and quirks and flavors and all kinds of stuff that Dr. Mahmood thinks about. But you have protons in the nucleus, and you have neutrons. And then in the shells, you have electrons. And all of these things have some mass. And then you have photons. And photons are massless particles of energy. Now, looking at our atom, let's try carbon. Carbon 
I'll put a 12, I'll put a 6. Here's another carbon. I'll put a 14 and I'll put a 6. And I'll put a box around it so it feels comfortable to you. Looks a little bit like something on a periodic table. Oh, I did say until quarter of. So I'll probably do two lectures. 50 minutes each. That's my goal. I know you only have a certain attention span. Hopefully you're not playing with your phone. Stay away from the thing. Anyway, this carbon. If you were to ask how many proton, neutrons, and electrons, the atomic number is smaller than the atomic weight. So the atomic number is six. Therefore, there's six protons, six electrons. Now, the protons aren't going to change unless the atom splits. The atom is defined by the atomic number. If it's got six around the periodic table, I hate to think I get that wrong in my age. But if it's got six, then it's a form of carbon. The electrons can change. They can either be added or subtracted or stay the same. But then the atomic weight is the protons plus the neutrons. So 12 minus 6 would be 6. So in this case, you have 6 neutrons. For this type of carbon, it's still 6 protons. It's still 6 electrons. But now 14 minus 6 is going to be 8 neutrons. These differ. If you look on your periodic table, the atomic weight is protons plus neutrons. You can't have 0.1 of a neutron. You either have a neutron or you don't. But on your atomic little periodic table, you see a 6, then you see 12.011. I can start writing what I'm saying. And that seems odd. It seems like there's 0.011 of a neutron, but there isn't. This is important. As chemists, we need to know how many grams of product are going to form. We need to know the average atomic weight of all the different types of naturally occurring carbon atoms. So this is the average ABG, if I could write, of all naturally occurring carbon atoms. In this case, let's say there wasn't a carbon-13, which there is, but this is carbon with an atomic number of tw weight of 12. This is carbon with an atomic weight of 14. If these were the only types and they were 50-50 in nature, you would have 13 for the atomic average weight, but it isn't. The atomic average weight is way closer to 12. So most carbon atoms in your life, most coal in your life is 12. But there definitely has to be some other ones that are higher because it goes above there. So there are some carbon 14s. If you're talking about carbon, you just say carbon. But if you want to distinguish between these two carbons, you have to talk about a parameter they have different. And the different parameter is the atomic weight. So if you were speaking of this, you'd call it carbon 12. And this one is called carbon 14. Carbon 12 versus carbon 14. Carbon-14 and carbon-12 are cousins to each other, but we don't use the word cousins. They are isotopes. Isotopes of each other. Every atom is an isotope. It's a phrase like saying, well, there's a boy, there's a girl. But if they're cousins, that's a phrase to describe them, how they relate to each other. Well, this is carbon-12, that's carbon-14. They're isotopes of each other, but every atom is an isotope. Some are stable. Carbon-12 is stable. Some are not stable. Carbon-14 is not stable. It decays by giving something away to become something else. So let's talk about isotopes. 
All right, so this is all very old stuff. If you have an isotope that's unstable, it gives off something. It could look like a block of sugar. It doesn't have to look like anything special. But it gives off something. And it gives off something on a set schedule, believe it or not. Now, when we first we had electricity with batteries long before we had power plants and we had radios and we could pick up things. And if you notice in a radio in a car, if you have AM radio, there's static when there's a lightning bolt. OK, so getting to understand that there are some things that cause static on the radio, oddly enough. And let's say this pen caused static on the radio. Well, we were very primitive about 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and we said that that pen must be radioactive. It does something to my radio. OK, so you have radioactive, it's an old phrase, isotopes. A lot of these chemistry phrases are really old, like if I like standing in front of a crowd, I like to be in the limelight. A lime and calcium oxide burns really brightly, and before there was power, they were able to like make light for stages with lime. But now we're stuck because we have no idea what that even means anymore. We still say limelight. Well, radioactive means it did something to the radio. So there's a collector of whatever particle is flying off of this thing. Let's call it a wand. And this is connected to something in the movies that has a dial. And it goes click a whole lot. This would be a Geiger counter. I think it's a Geiger Mueller counter, but the first name is always what's uh, used. So if you have something that's radioactive and gives off radioactivity, let's say um, this thing in my hand here was the wand of my Geiger counter. And it was radioactive, no matter what was coming off of it. I'll just explain to you what's coming off of it. It would just give the background radiation. There's a lot of background radiation. Bananas are radioactive. I'm slightly radioactive, OK? So it goes click, 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 click. Now, it could be clicking a whole lot, which means it's a very hot source. Or it could be clicking a little bit. Click, click. It doesn't mean that it's any less or more dangerous. It depends on what's flying and hitting the wand. That's the difference. All right, so what's flying and hitting the wand? Well, let's talk about this. Carbon-14 decays. Carbon-12 is stable, doesn't decay. It decays on a set schedule. Carbon-14. is 1% of all carbon atoms in a living thing. Because it's this carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere, if the living thing is breathing or absorbing oxygen one way or the other, the carbon-14 is going to get into that living thing. When the living thing dies, no more carbon-14 joins it. And the percentage of carbon-14, now this is not 1% of the creature, you're mostly water, okay? But 1% of all the carbon atoms you have is carbon-14. Right now I'm assuming you're alive if you're watching this lecture. So 1% of all carbon atoms are carbon-14, the living thing. They decay on a set schedule, so when I die, I don't know the exact number. I don't know, like, let's just say like 6,000 years, but it's like 5,800 years or something. But I like 6,000 because I can do that number quick. So around, here's my around symbol. So around 6,000 years, half of the carbon-14 is gone. I'll explain that to you. So if you had a block that was 100 grams of pure carbon-14, 
after about 5,800 years, but after about 6,000 years after the block, okay, it's a block of bone. It's a block of um, tree. <laughs> it's a piece of tree, okay? So anyway, after about 6,000 years, there's only like 50 grams of carbon-14 and 50 grams of the daughter products, okay? But after another 6,000 years, there's only going to be 25 grams of the carbon-14 left. 6,000 years is the half life of carbon-14. And it's not, it's more like 5,800 and something. But either way, what is this used for? Well, I think you've had this lecture once in your life. It's used for carbon dating. Pretty useful stuff. A piece of cloth from 6,000 years ago is going to have 0.5% carbon-14 of all its carbons. From 12,000 years ago, it's going to have 0.25%. And when we measure it and we get 0.25, we say this piece of cloth was made from a plant that lived 12,000 years ago. You can date bones. How old is the oldest man or something that we find in a bone? Well, we could date it that way. And right now, I'm really hoping this recorded. Anyway, uh, it's quarter of, and that's the first half of this week's lecture. I'm going to lecture right now, but you won't notice that. Let me, let me stop this for now, because it would be 50 minutes. Ah, stop recording. Stop recording.